Amen. We're going to study uh, Acts chapter 22 tonight. Amen. Father, thank you for the time we can gather together tonight, Lord. I sense that soon and very soon we're going to see your face, Lord. We're going to be eternally with you as a family in your kingdom. Lord, a lot of that is a mystery, even as you said in your word, eyes have not seen, ears have not word, heard, either has it entered in the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. But Lord, we thank you that you're preparing a place for us. And I pray tonight that we have prepared our hearts to hear what you have to say to us. So Lord, bless us tonight as we enter this study. Thank you for each and every one that's here and, and for the families represented here. We bless them, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you, church. Amen. Acts chapter 22, and we're going to pick it up in verse 16. I'm going to go from uh, verse 16 through 30. And your notes are pretty spread out because there's a lot in the middle but I didn't want to cover too many verses so we can get done tonight. Acts 22 and verse 16. Now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. This is the Apostle Paul uh, who received his sight. We studied that last week. He was knocked down in the desert and he's given his testimony. And he said, uh, Now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem... I was praying in the temple, and I was in a trance. And I saw him, that's the Lord, saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believe on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I was also standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then he said to me, Depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not... Uh, I'm sorry. And they listened to him until this word, and then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth. He is not fit to live. Then as they cried out, and they tore off their clothes and threw dust into the air... The commander ordered him to be brought back into the barracks and said that he would be examined under scourging, that he might know why they shouted so against him. Boy, the Jews were really upset with the Apostle Paul. And that, that whole uh, demonstration of the Jewish people, how they rip their clothes and throw dust in the air. And I don't know if you remember when they toppled the statue of Saddam Hussein, if you saw that on TV, uh, in Iraq. Uh, they were throwing shoes at it. It's, it's kind of a curse to throw the shoe. It's, it's the Middle, Middle Eastern chancla is what it is. And uh, <laughs> they, they, they were throwing the shoes. So they, they are very demonstrative that way about ripping their robe apart and throwing dust in the air, and that's what they were doing. So they bound the Apostle Paul with thongs, and Paul said to the centurion who stood by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? Now when the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander, saying, Be careful what you do. This man is a Roman. Then the commander came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman? He said, Yes. The commander answered, With a large sum I obtained this citizenship. And Paul said, I was born a citizen. Then immediately those who were about to examine him or scourge him withdrew from him and the commander was also afraid after he found out that he was a Roman because he had bound him. He had tied him up with leather straps. So the next day, because he wanted to know for certain why he was accused by the Jews, he released Paul from his bonds and commanded the chief priests and all their council to appear and then he brought Paul down and set him before them. So, boy, th what a turn of events, amen? There are times that God wants us to be silent, and there's times God wants us to speak. 
This is one of the times where God wanted the Apostle Paul to defend himself. And uh, that ended up in him being taken to Rome. And he was able to witness to more people before his execution. So let's get into this. Verses 16 through 21, we just read all of that. Paul continues with his testimony regarding his return to Jerusalem, how the Lord told him to depart from there. So let's go to Acts 19. Let's go back into history just a little bit here and catch up on that. So in Acts chapter 19, starting with verse 20, the Bible says, So the the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed, And when these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also go to Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus. But he himself stayed in Asia for a time. And remember, Asia is modern day Turkey now. And about that time, there arose a great commotion about the way. Now, any time in Scripture when you see the way, they're talking about Christianity. And it's interesting that Jesus said, I am the way. (laughs) So they're talking about Christianity. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Diana and brought no small profit to the craftsmen. So this guy was making little silver idols, and they were selling for a lot of money. And he called them together with the workmen of similar occupations and said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. This is how we make our money. Moreover, you see and hear, not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are not gods which we made with hands. Not only so, uh, this trade of ours is in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. Boy, this guy was really deceived, wasn't he? The whole world was not worshiping Diana. But when the enemy gets a hold of someone, their their discernment goes away. They can be so easily deceived. Verse 28. So when they heard this, they were full of wrath, and they cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And then the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Aristotle, Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's traveling companions. And when Paul wanted to go into the people, the disciples would not allow him. Then some of the officials of Asia, who were his friends, sent to him pleading that he would not go into the theater. So you can see where Paul went. There was a great tumult wherever Paul went. Because people, when they're stuck in their beliefs and they're deceived, and you try to tell them the truth, you know what happens. They get upset, they get angry, even families one against another. And we've seen all of this kind of stuff. I mean, we read that the whole city came into confusion. Remember what happened during 2020? All the burning and looting and rioting. And it just takes a couple people to start that and just people flow right in. That's why Exodus says, thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Usually the crowds are wrong. They're just wrong. And they did the same thing at the crucifixion of Jesus when they yelled out, crucify him, crucify him, and they were yelling loudly. Other people yelled with him, and it turned, it turned all the people to yell, crucify him. So um, Paul continued with that testimony, and, but the Lord told him, don't return to Jerusalem. So in verses 22 through 23, when the Jews heard that, they reacted violently to Paul's testimony. Why did they do that? Why were they so freaked out? Well, first of all, it's about control. The Pharisees had control over the Jewish people. And they were already upset because Rome was in the mix, trying to rule them. So they they didn't want to lose any more control than they had of the people. And so let's take a look at John 15 and find out why. John chapter 15, verses 18 through 25. 
John 15, 18, Jesus promised this not only to his disciples, but to us. And sometimes I know we get disheartened and say, I, I, I don't understand why my family or my friends or my co-workers or, or people that I speak, why do they get so upset? Well, here's why. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Okay, so let me describe this to you. If you're in a, you're at night and you get pulled over by a, a policeman, maybe your tail lights out or maybe you broke the speed limit, whatever. They shine that really bright light in your mirror so that you can hardly see it all, okay? So when we share the gospel with someone who's in the darkness, it's like taking a flashlight and shining it right in their eyes. It, it disturbs them. It upsets them. I know I used to get upset when people would try to tell me uh, that I needed to get saved. Uh, when you're not born again, everything that comes to bring you to the light is, quote, your enemy. But once we come to the light, then we can see clearly that's exactly what we needed all along. So Jesus said, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. Because if you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they have persecuted me, Jesus said, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they'll keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. And he who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. And it's just amazing the difference between light and darkness. It's, it's, it's amazing to me. Uh, you, can, you can be at a family reunion. Everybody's getting along great until you bring up Jesus. You know, and I've had people say, well, you know, but if you just talk about God, then they don't seem to get so upset. I know. When you mention the name of Jesus Christ, everybody starts freaking out. Uh, because I think in, inwardly we know, as Hebrews chapter 8, verses uh, 10 through 12 says, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and into their hearts, and they will no longer teach their neighbor, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. So it's called a conscience, and everybody has a God conscience. So when people say, I'm an atheist, they're a liar. There, there are no atheists. Uh, someone once said, well, not everybody has faith. Yes, they do. Uh, Romans chapter 12 and verse 3 says that no man ought to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but they ought to think soberly according to the measure of faith which God has dealt to every man. God gives faith to everybody. Everybody gets faith. So there is no excuse, but they react violently because the darkness does react to the light. It runs away. The minute you shine a flashlight, I just happen to have one here. And uh, that's very irritating. <laughs> just in case the lights go out, I thought I'd be prepared. Anyway, um, let's go on here in Acts chapter 22. To verses 24 and 25. So, so far, Paul, Paul's given his testimony, and the Lord tell, uh, he's given his testimony to the leaders there, the Roman leaders, and he, he's telling them he was told not to come back to Jerusalem. And when the Jews hear this, his testimony, they react violently to his testimony. So then in verses 24 through 25, Acts chapter 22, the Romans removed Paul from the crowd intending to beat him, to scourge him. Now, you know what scourging was? 
That wasn't just a little leather whip. That was a whip with pieces of bone and stones in it. I mean, when they scourged somebody, it literally caused them to bleed. So they were intending to scourge him, but Paul asked a question to the centurion whether it was legal to scourge a Roman who, has, who is uncondemned. In other words, I haven't gone to court. I haven't been condemned yet. So he throws that out there, and Paul used this reasoning once before uh, with the Philippians jailer. So let's, let's read about that again, just as a reminder. Acts chapter 16. Love that story. This is the story when Paul and Silas were in jail and there was a great earthquake and all the chains fell off everybody and the jailer was going to kill himself because he thought all the prisoners were going to run away. And uh, Paul, uh, he came in trembling and asked this question, what must I do to be saved? That is the question. So Acts chapter 16, verse 25 the Bible says at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and they were singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. Even in jail, he was a witness. Even in jail. So there's a scripture in Colossians that says, whether you eat or whether you drink and whatever you do, it's also in 1 Corinthians, whatever you do, give glory to the Lord. So wherever we are, even in a restaurant, wherever we are, we're to give glory to the Lord. Uh, I'm going to stop and tell you a story. I think you've heard this one before, but I'll make it quick. I was on a plane flight from Washington to California. I was really tired. I had gone up for a conference and just uh, had spent a lot of time ministering to people. I was very tired. And I just said, Lord, I just want to get on the plane and fly home. I just want to relax, so don't let me sit by anybody. <laughs> God, God has a great sense of humor. A Jesuit priest sat right next to me. <laughs> so the whole way to California, we talked back and forth about the Bible and about Scripture. And the cool thing about that was we weren't whispering. So two rows forward and two rows back could hear clearly all that discussion about being born again. And uh, it was, it, you know, it, it's God's plan, not our plan. You know, we, we want to do our certain thing. But if we follow the Lord, he'll make sure that he gives us the strength. That was a fun time, too. And he was a cool brother. He was from Africa. And uh, he was going to uh, Los Angeles to straighten out the priesthood there. So, <laughs> and the guy knew the, he knew the Bible, too. So it was, it was really a really great time. So in Acts 16 and verse 25, Paul and Silas are singing and praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners are listening and verse 26 says suddenly there was a great earthquake so that even the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed what kind of earthquake is that I mean can you imagine you're in handcuffs and they fall off you got chains around your legs and they fall off and all the doors fly open so the Bible says in verse 27, the keeper of the prison awaked out of sleep and saw that all the prison doors were open. And he was supposing that the prisoners had fled. So he drew out his sword and was about to commit suicide. He was about to kill himself. Why? Because if you were guarding prisoners in a Roman prison and uh, they escaped, they would, they would beat you to death. They would, it wasn't just an execution. It was, a be, it, it was to help everybody else to know this is a serious thing. You better not lose any prisoners. So they would make an example out of them. So I think he felt it was better to kill himself than to let the Romans get a hold of him and punish him. So the scripture says, Paul called out with a loud voice saying, don't do yourself any harm. We are all here. Then he called for a light, and he ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So he saw God's power. But notice first there was praise involved. They were praising the Lord. They were singing praises to the Lord. And any time we're in trouble, sometimes the best thing to do is to pray and sing psalms rather than trying to figure out how to get out of it. Just pray and sing psalms and God will bring you the answer. 
So Paul called out with a loud voice, and this man trembled, came in and said, What must I do to be saved? Verse 31. They said, and man, I don't know why people have a hard time with this verse. I mean, you would think that the Bible says, well, first you've got to come to church, then you have to go through an eight-week course, then after that, we have to examine you to see if you really, truly believe. And if you wear lipstick or don't wear a dress, and they go on and on and on and make salvation all about silly rules instead of exactly what the Scripture says. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now that word believe is tricky because there are a lot of people that believe up here, but there's nothing here. So the word believe in the Greek is the Greek word pisteva, which means to completely, totally rely upon. And so I have this table at home. It's, uh, it's made out of burl wood. It's really a, a heavy-duty table. It'd probably hold 500 pounds. So there's times when I illustrate that I step up on that table and say, now I am completely trusting this table. There's no ropes, no guidelines. I'm not holding on to anything. I'm completely trusting this table to hold me up. That's how our faith has to be. We can't be relying on church service, ministry service, going to church, tithing, reading our Bible, or doing any other good thing for salvation. It's not about that. It's about totally trusting what Jesus did on the cross. You say, well then, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says we're, we're called uh, as his works, as his workmanship. We're called to do good works. We're the workmanship of Christ. So what is that about? That's about rewards. That's not about salvation. If you read the scriptures above, it says, for by grace are you saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is a gift from God, not by works, so that no man can boast and then it says, for we are his workmanship called to do good works. Yes, once we're born again, God can move through us, do good works. Those are not for salvation. Those are for rewards. And if you want to study that further, you can look into 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting with about verse 12. And you can see how the judgment seat of Christ works. And again, it's not how much either. Some people think, well, the more I do, no. It's, it's all about the heart. It's all about what are your motives. What kind of works are these? You know, because it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be right. Some people have greater ability than others. And so it's not about how much. It's about how much in America. It's like that guy's bumper sticker that said, he who dies with the most gold wins. And I would have loved to paste another one on the right side of the bumper that says, no, he that dies with the most gold still dies. You know? <laughs> And, and that's the truth. But in America, it's such a competitive society that the more you have, the better off you are. It's just not true. Jesus put it this way. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? And then he gives this story about a rich man who had uh, his crops grew and they grew and he, he couldn't even fit them all in his barn. And he said, man, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to pull down my barns and build bigger ones to put all this stuff in. And then God said, thou fool, tonight your soul will be required of you. Then who shall all these things be? And all these things isn't what we worship. We can use things. It's fine. You know, God, God blesses us with things. He just doesn't want us to worship them. And he wants to be first in our lives. So that word believe, when they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, what they were really saying is totally, completely put all of your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Okay, so what were the Jews doing? Well, Mark chapter 7 covers it pretty well. It says uh, that they follow traditions. They have all these things they have to do. They can eat certain foods and not eat other foods. They have to wash their hands several times before they eat. They do all these rituals and all those things, thinking that that was going to get them into heaven. So let's read about that. Uh, that's not in our notes, but Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. God calls it iniquity. In other words, it's trying to do good things to gain salvation from the Lord. And listen to what God has to say about that. So in Isaiah chapter 1, starting with verse 10. And I'll wait for everybody to get to Isaiah there. 
Okay, it looks like everybody's there. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me? God is saying, give me a good reason why you're doing all these sacrifices. Okay? To what purpose is that? Verse, uh, verse 11, he goes on to say, I have had enough of burnt offerings and rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? In other words, to step into my temple, okay? Bring no more futile sacrifices to me. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moon, I could get in trouble in the Greek Orthodox Church just with that verse right there. <laughs> Because they got incense everywhere. You know that little thing that does the incense? Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of your assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and your sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. And when you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear because your hands are full of blood. Okay, so let me give you a scripture to back that up because somebody might take that wrong and say, oh, well, then sometimes God doesn't hear my prayers. There's certain instances where the Lord says that in scripture. One of them is Psalm 66, 18. Psalm 66, 18 says, If I regard, and here's the same word as in Isaiah, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So again, iniquity is doing good things to gain salvation. The Bible calls it lawlessness, but it's, it's literally throwing off of God's grace and his law and doing your own thing to get to heaven. That's really the definition of it. And there's another place in Matthew chapter 7, we won't go there, but in Matthew 7, uh, Jesus uh, points out in the end days, many will come to him saying, Lord, Lord, didn't we do many wonderful works in your name? And in your name, didn't we cast out devils and, and prophesy and do many wonderful things? And he will say, Depart from me, you who work iniquity, I never knew you. So the Bible definition of iniquity is trying to do works to get favor with God, specifically for salvation. It won't work. So God gives the answer here in Isaiah chapter 1. He says, wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. That's verse 16. Put away the evil of your doings from my eyes. So God is basically saying, trust in my blood and repent from your sin. That's what he's saying. Repent and trust in the blood. Verse uh, uh, 17, he says, learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, They'll be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So God is telling them, be willing and obedient. Be willing to turn from your own devices to try to get into heaven and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. You know, he's, he's given a future. The, uh, he, actually, he's talking about Ezekiel 36, 26, where it says, I will, I will wash you with clean water. Well, you know, water's not going to wash away sin, so he's obviously talking about the blood of Christ. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen? So... Um, Back to Acts 16, uh, verse, uh, he asked them, what can I do to be saved? Verse 30, and they said, verse 31, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, 
and your household. Now there's a promise that we can hold on to as well. Because if the leader of the house gets saved, then the children will follow. Remember, children do what you do more than do what you say. And it's absolutely true. You know, we mimic what our parents do. Uh, we can say everything we want to say, but they watch what we do. Amen? That's what they do. So, then they spoke the word of the Lord to them and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same night, same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all of his family were baptized. So immediately, and man, I've gotten into it with some preachers that say, well, no, we don't baptize anybody unless they go through a class. Look, faith is between you and the Lord. Baptism is between you and the Lord too. I'm, I don't have God's heart to be able to judge your heart and see whether you mean it or not. Baptism is before the Lord. I just watched Frank's baptism last week. Uh, I was on YouTube and I thought, man, I'm going to watch those baptisms again. And that was glorious. You know, it's just glorious to see somebody out of their own will just come forward and say, I want to be baptized. Uh, so immediately, the, he and his family were baptized. Now, when he had brought them into his house, he set food before. This is the jailer. Okay. <laughs> He brought food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with his whole household. And when it was daytime, the judges, or the magistrates, sent the officers and said, well, let those men go. So the keeper of the prison reported these words to Paul, saying, well, the judges, or the magistrates, have sent to let you go. Therefore, go ahead and leave. Go in peace. But Paul, <laughs> Paul was so bold. Paul said to them, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned Romans. They've thrown us into prison, and now they want to sneak us out, put us out secretly? No, indeed. Let them come themselves and get us out. <laughs> wow. So the officers told these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard they were Romans. Then they came and pleaded with them, <laughs> please leave our city. <laughs> and they brought them out and asked them to depart from the city. So they went out of the prison, they entered the house of Lydia, and when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and then departed. What a great story. We're going to end this up tonight back in Acts chapter 22 uh, with verses 26 through 30. So if you'll remember that once Paul... Uh, heard that uh, once the commander heard that Paul was a Roman, he backed away off the beating and everything else. So the Roman commander releases Paul, and then he orders the chief priest. You know, you know what that's like? That's like saying, we don't want to talk to you. Get out of our face. And then the, the president you know, uh, of, the, of the, uh, the club comes in and says, no, everybody sit back down. You need to listen to him. I mean, it just shoved it right in their face. And I know it was God that made them do that. God wanted them to hear the gospel. He wanted them to hear Paul's testimony so that no man would have any excuse. Amen? Because at the, at the day of the last judgment, no one's going to have any excuse. God says that in Romans chapter 1. He says they will all be without excuse. So... The Roman commander releases Paul, orders the chief priests and council of the Jews to get back in there and assemble in order to hear Paul's case. It's another example of how God can make a way when there is no way. Amen? Boy, have we ever seen that, especially in this church and in many of our lives, where there is no way, God makes a way. He makes a way. So let's take a look at Revelation chapter 3, one of my favorite verses to pray when we're uh, asking the Lord to help someone either get work or uh, have an opening for a new, new job, those kinds of things. I always pray these verses, Revelation 3, 7, and 8, reminding the Lord of this. These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and the one who shuts 
and no one opens. Verse 8, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength. You have kept my word, and you have not denied my name. And as long as we're following the Lord, God's going to have his way. And I have seen so many doors closed where no one could open them, and so many doors opened. So Romans chapter 8, verse 31, we're going to end with uh, Romans chapter 8 tonight. So just to go briefly back over our notes here, Paul gives his testimony uh, to the uh, Roman leaders, and the Jews were present, and he tells them God told him not to come back to Jerusalem. And we read why, because everywhere Paul goes, there's a tumult, okay? And uh, then the Jews react violently to Paul's testimony because they don't want to believe. So the Romans remove Paul from the crowd, intending to beat him, but then Paul says, is it right for you to beat a Roman who's uncondemned? So they back off of that, and then the commander makes a decision. You know what? I'm going to bring everybody back in, and they're going to have to listen to that testimony whether they like it or not. <laughs> I think that's so awesome. So Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. Don't you love it when God has his way? Amen. Romans 8, 31 through 39. So what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Think about that. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him, that's with Christ, also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. That's why we shouldn't be worried when people pass judgment on us. They don't have holes in their hands. They weren't on the cross. They don't have the legal, spiritual right to judge anything. Only God has that right. Okay? So, and I'm talking about passing judgment. Okay? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? It's Christ who died, and furthermore has also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, and who is making intercession for us. Maybe that is something that we need to talk about just for a few minutes. Intercession is not praying of how you think God wants things to happen. Intercession is seeking to get the heart of God for what you're praying for. It's really truly asking God, how do you want me to pray for this? So Jesus is literally interceding for every one of us 24-7, praying for us. Remember what he told Peter? Peter, I prayed for you that your strength does not fail. And Peter eventually got up out of the muck and mire from denying Christ and went back to it and was one of the greatest apostles in the scripture. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or even sword? As it is written, for your sake we're killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And again, you know, another scripture that comes to mind, our life is hidden with, with Christ in God. Our life's already hidden there. We're already seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So we're just having to move through this life in order to get there. So Paul says this, and I think there are some things that we as Christians should be persuaded about. I think there's things that we should never move on at all. I think the virgin birth is not something that we can question. He was born of a virgin. It's prophesied and it happened. I believe the intimate coming of the Lord Jesus Christ 
is something that we don't debate. Now, there are some people that teach there is no rapture. Well, they have a right to be wrong. But the scripture proves that Christ will come. He's called our blessed hope. Okay? And then we can't ever move on the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. We can never move on that. And there's some people that say, well, you know, they beat him so hard that he was like in a coma, and they thought he was dead, but he wasn't really dead. And I said, well, what about the spear in the side with blood and water coming out? You know, what about they wrapped him in, in cloths like they do dead people, and, and dead bodies, I should say, and put him in a tomb? What about all that? You know, that is non-disputable evidence. And then we have to believe there's no other way, nothing but the blood of Jesus. We have to believe the blood 100%. Some people say, well, that's just an ugly doctrine, the blood. Well, it's the blood that takes away our sin. Doesn't just wash it away. Doesn't just put it away. It, wa it takes it away. Takes away. The Lamb of God takes away the sin. So Paul says, I'm persuaded about this. I'm going to read it to you the way it reads here, and then I'm going to go back and read it to you the way it reads in the Greek language, okay? I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities or powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Some may say, well, I really messed up. That's not going to separate you from the love of God. You may get corrected. You may even be chastised. But you will not be separated from the love of God. So here's the way it reads. Paul says, I'm convinced and I'm not going to change. I am convinced that nothing in dying and nothing in living, not even angels or even demonic powers, principalities, nothing presently happening in our life or anything to happen in the future. Nothing high, nothing low, not any other thing that's ever been created will be able to separate us from the love that God has for us in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. That is an undeniable love. It's agape love. It's God's kind of love. It never fades away. The scripture tells us in 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, because I know some people really worry about, well, man, I keep, you know, I, I'm just not sure that I'm walking right. You know, what do I do? What do I do? Well, really, I don't know anyone that walks the way God wants them to walk. We're, we're attempting to walk that way. We're attempting to walk before the, the Lord in righteousness. But we live in a human body that oftentimes we go sideways. So who's going to keep us? Who's going to make sure we get there? 1 Peter 1.5 says, well, actually, let's, let's start with uh, verse 4. 1 Peter 1.4. To an inheritance that is incorruptible. I want to park right there. I talked with a family who had the will changed of their deceased loved one. So they corrupted the will. They took the will that was his last wishes and they messed around with the signature and changed the will so that things could go the way they wanted it to go and the way, instead of the way he wanted it to go. That's corrupting a will, okay? Well, the scripture says here, we have an inheritance that's incorruptible. It can't be corrupted. It can't be changed. It is undefiled. Nothing can defile our inheritance. And it does not fade away. It is reserved in heaven for you. How many of you have ever made reservations to a restaurant? Okay, several of us. When you got there, did, uh, you just, did they ask you, do you have reservations? And did you tell them, yes, we do? And then did they say, oh, sorry, uh, we gave away your table? They didn't do that. Uh-uh. Because the next thing would be, I need to talk to the manager. Yeah, you just go straight to the top after that. Because most employees really don't care anymore. <laughs> so we have gone straight to the top. 
to the Lord Jesus Christ who's interceding for us. And he says, our inheritance is uncorruptible. It's undefiled. It will not fade away. And it's reserved in heaven for us. We have a reservation. Okay, verse 5. How do we get there? Well, we're kept by the power of God through faith. So what does it take to get there? Faith. We have to believe. If someone says, well, I, I prayed a prayer even though I'm living for the devil. I prayed a prayer so I know I got my ticket. No, you don't. Unless you believe and fully trust in your heart, you have been deceived. And there are people that teach, pray the prayer, go to heaven. No. The scripture does not say that. The scripture says, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. For with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. But with the heart, it's with the heart that we are truly born again. It's with the heart. I knew a lady one time that got saved in a four square church. And uh, after I accepted the Lord, I wanted to know, when did it happen? And she said, well, the, the preacher preached, and it was an amazing sermon, and I was convicted, tears running down my face. And he said, if there's someone out there that hasn't been born again, I want you to get up out of your seat and come forward. And she just was shaking, and she said she got up and started walking forward. And I said, so when did you get saved? And she said, I got saved when I stood up. I said, what? And she said, that's right. The Bible says, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and then with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So she got saved when she believed, but she came forward and confessed publicly Jesus Christ in her prayer. So it's, it's the heart. It's the heart. That's what God looks at. So he says, you were kept by the power of God through faith, unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So in this you should greatly rejoice, even though for a little while, if need be, you were grieved by various trials. We all go through trials. So how's it going to look when we get there? Now, we are going to be judged because of our works. Okay, our works, what motives we had, those are either going to receive rewards or loss of rewards. Okay, and that's very clear in Scripture. But how are we going to look when we get there? What, what, what are we going to look like? Well, turn with, me to the, turn with me to the book of Revelation and go one page to the left to the book of Jude. And this, when I read this verse, it was like, really? And the Lord said, yes. Yes, my word is true. Yes. So the scripture says in verse 24... And Jude only has one chapter, so if you want Jude chapter 1, verse 24, I just say Jude 24. Now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. He is going to present us faultless. There's nobody in this world that is faultless. There's nobody. We all have faults. We all have stumbling. You know, one of the clearest verses in Scripture that teaches us that, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, so in other words, God's saying, if you'll fess up to what you know you did wrong, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. So what God is saying there is, if you'll fess up to what you did, I'll not only forgive that, I'll forgive the stuff you don't even know about. I'll forgive the little stumbling blocks in your mind that you don't even know are a stumbling block. I'll forgive the things that you think that I hear all day long because God hears us 24 hours. You know, Remember Malachi 3.16? He, even those who think upon his name, he writes it down in a book. So God is, is going to keep us. He's going to present us faultless. Amen? So David had that truth too. And 
You know, we all know, and we're not judging him, but Scripture teaches us that David did some things that were not quite right in the sight of the Lord, as we all do. But David wrote this because he knew who kept him. This is Psalm 121. David said, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence comes my help. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Not like the disciples who slumbered. Yeah, God doesn't slumber, okay? Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. For the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. Do you know what that means? If you have shade on your right hand, that means somebody's standing really close to you. Amen? That means that he is right there all the time. The sun will not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. I really had to study that one out. I thought, well, the moon doesn't really affect me at all. He wasn't talking about the physical moon or the physical sun. He's talking about 24 hours a day. He's talking about whether the sun's up or whether the moon's up, that nothing will strike you. And then verse 7, the Lord will preserve you from all evil. He, he shall preserve your soul. The Lord will, and I want to park right there too, because we have someone that we dearly love in the hospital right now. And their body uh, is, for all intents and purposes, going away. Uh, they don't have a liver. And uh, we expect any day now they're going to go be with the Lord. God is concerned with the soul. Yeah, our body will decay. Look around. <laughs> our body decays. It's decaying every day. We get wrinkles. We Stuff falls off. Hair falls off. This and that and the other. But God is concerned with our soul. That last verse, the Lord will preserve your, your soul. He will preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. His love is unthinkable. It's indescribable. It's a love that we can barely understand just a little bit of it. But God is a Father whose love never fails. And once we put our trust in Him and we continue to trust Him, continue to believe in Him, and that's what my message is for Sunday, uh, I want to close with uh, just one scripture that I put here. And uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be called Standing Firm in the Faith. Okay? Standing, it didn't say standing firm in the flesh. It said standing firm in the faith. Amen? So even a casual view of society shows us that people desperately need the Lord. Nobody's going to argue with that. So it's up to us, it's incumbent upon us to be faithful to share the good news. So the scripture says, Thanks be to God who has given us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. God says we'll bring forth much fruit. Amen. Would you stand with me? Um, it's another notable miracle. It's two minutes to eight. So. <laughs> Amen. Lord, we just want to thank you for your goodness. It's difficult for me to verbalize how deep your love is, how wide, how high. It's almost inconceivable, Lord. But we receive your love. We receive the gift that you've given us of eternal life. Father, I pray for anyone who might be listening on YouTube even at this moment in this prayer that if someone there does not know you, they may know about you. They may even have knowledge of you. 
But Father, without knowing you, without being born again, there's no hope of salvation. Only through the Jesus Christ the Lord. And I pray, Lord, that if there's anyone in that case that would hear this on YouTube or even here in, in the house tonight, that they would simply cry out to you and say, Lord God, I am a sinner and I turn from it right now. And I ask you, Lord God, to forgive me. I believe you are the Lord, Jesus. And I believe that you were raised from the dead. And I put my trust right now in the blood that you shed on the cross at Calvary for my salvation. Would you come into my life and save my soul and help me to follow you all the days of my life? And if you pray that to the Lord sincerely and you mean it in your heart, God says, all that, all that, uh, that, that uh, come to me, I will in no way throw them out. And so, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you will help all of us to remember what we've learned here tonight. That no matter what, height, nor depth, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor anything thing present or past or anything in the future will not be able to separate us from your love which is in Christ Jesus the Lord. So I pray we'll go throughout this week with that in mind. And Lord, open doors of opportunity for us to share you with others. Bless now your church, Lord, in Jesus' name, as we dismiss. Amen. Amen. God bless you, church. You're dismissed. And I pray that you will have a wonderful, peaceful rest of the week. We'll see you. That was due for our peace was laid on.